Well, we are talking about love. What is more special than love? Nothing, I say. It is um, something that poets have written about, songs have been written about, movies have been written about. We all love love. And over this month, we are going to be talking a little bit about what real godly love actually is. As much as we are all excited about love, I think there are a lot of misconceptions around what love actually is. We have been playing a fun little game over the last couple of weeks. We put some lyrics on the screen, and whoever guesses where it is from will win a Starbucks gift card to the value of 15 smackaroonies. That is where your tithes are going to. Okay, so, <laughs> right, put it up. Let's go. Okay, I'm going to try my best. Okay, so here we go. It says this. Let me just read it with a straight face, not sing the tune. I'll shine up the old brown shoes, put on a brand new shirt. I'll get home early from work if you say that you love me. <laughs> who can tell me where that is from? I feel like my dad is going to know where that is from. But who else outside of my dad? Oh, boy. Anybody. Nobody. I get the gift card if nobody gets it. <laughs> it's mine if nobody gets it. Is there not a single hand? Okay, we got one. We got one. Yes. Who? What? <laughs> Amy, is that, is that an answer or a commentary or a... I don't know the name or the band, but I remember it was in a movie. Good job. Um, <laughs> didn't I, didn't I, didn't I see you crying? Oh, wow. That sounded pretty good. Where's Cole? That sounded pretty good. All right, we cannot delay any further. I've given you an opportunity. Ah, Jacob Bellman! Somebody, we needed a hero to rise up. So um, it is from the band Sheep Trick, and it is from the song, I Want You to Want Me. Ah, uh, I know, you guys are so holy. Next week I'll put on the lyrics for Amazing Grace and everybody will get it secular music that the pastors listen to. <laughs> um, alrighty, so the title of my message today is, I want you to want me. It sounds like it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it will make sense in the next couple of minutes as we dive into our next theme around love. So come with me to 1 Corinthians 13 verses 1 to 4. We are working our way through this incredible passage of Scripture as we look at what real godly love is. Uh, and it says this, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now we get into what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. Love does not envy. And we are going to be sitting in that truth a little bit this morning. Selfish jealousy is at odds with God's type of love. The Greek word translated envy means to burn with zeal. Literally, the sense is to be heated or to boil over with envy, hatred, or anger. In the context of 1 Corinthians 13, the idea is that love does not focus on personal desires, but real godly love is selfless love. It is not selfish love. As I was uh, studying this out in the week, I came to realize that Scripture has a ton to say about envy or selfishness. Listen to what it says here in Exodus 20, verses 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. Oh, boy. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or his female servant, his ox or donkey. No coveting your neighbor's ox or donkey. Uh, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. 
Envy is the opposite of God's commandment not to covet. All over the Old Testament, we see this command that we should not be coveting our neighbor's things. The New Testament carries on and it says this, Romans 13 verse 10 carries on in the same heart. It says, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. The only one who truly loves will be in conformity to the Ten Commandments and envy will be excluded. Again, this theme that real love, godly love, is selfless love. It is not selfish love. It does not envy. It does not covet. It does not desire to take things from others. Proverbs 14 verses 30 says it really beautifully. It says it this way, a heart at peace gives life to the body. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. When I think of the bones of the body, I think of the foundation of the body. Um, If you remove the bones, if you remove the skeleton, what's left is just a whole bunch of mush. Um, There won't be much without the bones. And I love how Proverbs says that when we envy, when we covet, when we live our lives in a way that we're constantly longing and desiring what has not been given to us, it will literally cause rot in our lives that goes right down to the foundation of our life. Real love, real life, and real prosperity is not found in our longing or desiring for other things. But real life and real love is found in peace in the heart. It's not about what we have and what we don't have. It's not about longing for those things that we desire, but it's about having peace within our hearts and seeing the good things that are right in front of us. That is what will bring life to the body. I believe that this is a message that is every little bit as relevant today as it's ever been. And the reason I say that is because we are living in the time of social media. I don't think there has ever been a time in human history where what your neighbor has and what your neighbor is getting up to and where your neighbor is going and the amazing life that your neighbor has and the wrinkleless face your neighbor has. If you take a Snapchat photo, I highly recommend it. Gosh, you look great when you take Snapchat photos, right? (laughs) But never before has what the neighbors are getting up to been in front of us like right now. Never before do I believe that this idea of feeling like we're not good enough, this idea like we don't feel like we're living up to the standard, we're not quite where we need to be, we are not quite keeping up with the Joneses. I don't know that it's ever been an issue as much as it is in our culture right now. We are unhappy, we are depressed, we feel like nothing is good enough. We feel like we're always behind the eight ball, and I believe it's because that envy is rotting the very foundation of who we are. It is in the bones because we are constantly seeing what others have and what we don't. True godly love does not envy. Instead, true love, God's love, rejoices when others are blessed. There is no room for envy Love does not seek to benefit itself, and it is not content with what it has because its focus is on meeting the needs of others. This is what true godly love is all about. It is when it becomes selfless that we will find life in the body and the rot will start to disappear off of the bones. As I was uh, thinking about today's message, I realized that the message could be all as short as all of this. And I could say to you, okay, folks, go out there this week, uh, go make some good tackles, don't envy, and that's where we stop. But that's obviously not all there is to the story. So I was thinking about my own life, and I was thinking about the areas where I struggle with envy, or rather where I have struggled with envy within my life. And what I would like to do this morning is share a couple with my struggles with you And hopefully as we do that, we will come to realize that we are both struggling really around some of the same things. 
So we're going to go through a couple of things, and I'm hoping that I can share some light and some perspective on some of these things that I believe we might be envying when it comes to others. First thing we're going to touch on is real love does not envy your neighbor's gifts. Real love does not envy your neighbor's gift. When I was about, how old was I? I think it was about 11, 12 years old. My uh, parents moved us from where we were living. We were living a calm, simple, beautiful life. And uh, we were moved to a new place that was a little bit more competitive, a little bit more edgy. And I was placed into a school that was absolutely sports mad. To be a little bit more specific, the school I went to was rugby and cricket mad. What are these things, ask you Americans? These are, in fact, sports. Imagine football and baseball. They are very similar. Um, I remember up until this point in my life, my dad used to take me to art classes on a Saturday morning. But the minute I went to this new school, I realized how uncool art was, and I ditched that, and I became all about sports. Sports, sports, sports. That's what it was about. That's what everybody loved. That's what everybody was into. It's at about this time where I met a guy. He was in my class. He was one of my best friends. I'm going to say his name once. You will not be able to repeat it because it's an Afrikaans name. But his name was Esbert Fenter was this guy's name. Okay, for, uh, to keep it simple, we'll call him E.V. today. Um, E.V. was hands down one of the most irritating individuals I've ever met in my entire life. Um, and I can tell you he was probably the most gifted individual I've ever met in my entire life when it came to sports. This guy was unbelievable when it came to sports, and I know we've all met this guy. You've all grown up with this one guy that doesn't practice, that doesn't care, but when he shows up, he is the best guy you've ever seen in your life. When you find yourself in a school and in an environment where sports is the religion, EV was the shining light in this world, and man, I just felt like I could never keep up with this guy. Um, I remember in high school, if you could make first team rugby or first team cricket in high school by the age of 17, you were a phenomenon. He played both first team rugby and cricket at the age of 16. Um, he was unbelievable. Uh, what was even more frustrating was how good he was at the sports he did not even do or care about. Um, I'll never forget our school had a gala one time where it was all the best swimmers in the school and there was competition and it was inter-house. And uh, E.V. decided he was going to enter as a joke. Um, he did not actually swim. I don't even think he owned a Speedo. And we had this one kid in the school that was the swimmer of the school. They would make announcements about him in assembly. He was practicing for state. He had a personal coach. We all made fun of him all the time, but it's fine, right? He was the best swimmer ever. Um, E.V. actually beat him in the swimming pool as a joke, sarcastically, okay? It was like, what is happening right now? Um, I remember I wanted to beat this guy so badly in tennis. I, I just figured it out. I was like, tennis is my best shot. I can beat him in tennis. I feel like I can take him in a tennis match. So I actually sneakily trained for like six months. Every time he brought it up, I told him tennis is the stupidest thing ever. But actually, I was really working hard behind the scenes. I planned it perfectly, and randomly one day, when he didn't expect it, I was like, you want to go knock the ball around a little bit? And he said yes. I was like, I'm going to beat this guy in a tennis match. <laughs> when we got to the second set, he started playing with his left hand because <laughs> he got so bored in the match. He was right-handed. I was right-handed. He switched to his left hand, and he then beat me in the second set with his left hand, Okay. So this is who this guy was, highly frustrating, and I remember growing up in high school, never feeling like anything was good enough, never feeling like I measured up, never feeling like I truly reached my potential, never feeling like anything was ever going to work. I, I, I was constantly overshadowed by this guy that was just unbelievable at everything I desperately wanted to be good at. And uh, I got to my matric year, and it sort of went on like this forever. Even when I did good stuff on the sports field, it would be like, I caught five catches today, 
and then he would have caught 20 catches. You know, it's that kind of vibe. Finally, in matric, there was a, uh, we had a Toastmasters coming to our school where different people will do speeches from different schools. It was a big deal. It was this big regional thing. And the English teacher came to me and said to me, we would like for you to be the MC, the master of ceremonies at the Toastmasters. One of the reasons she asked me was, is because I was one of the few people that could actually speak English in an Afrikaans school. So she was like, we need you to step up to the plate. I was like, there's no ways I'm doing public speaking. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I want to play rugby for South Africa. I don't have time for this stuff. My friends thought it would be a laugh, so they said to me, go do it. Found myself randomly being the MC at a Toastmasters event, which ended up being a pretty big Toastmasters event. There were judges there from around the country. It was this big deal. I got up. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just winging it the entire time. And basically, all I did was get up and make fun of the people that were making speeches. That's basically, I wasn't sure if this is how it was supposed to go, but that's basically what I did. After everything was done, one of the judges actually came to me and said to me, I just want to commend you and say to you that you're one of the most gifted MCs I've ever seen in my entire life, and I've done this for 20 years. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm like, what I'm doing is not this. I want to be a sports star. I don't even think about this. And he said to me, well, anyways, you keep doing what you're doing. And it was just this amazing thing where this entire time, my entire high school I was so focused on what EV had. I was so focused on what this guy's gifting was that I looked past completely what my gift was. I didn't even know that I had it. I didn't even know that it existed because I was so filled with envy and I was so filled with jealousy around his gift and who he was. Funnily enough, this is not completely an isolated thing and we actually see that in the New Testament, in the book of Corinthians actually, Paul starts to deal with the same issue as this. And what's happening is, is the church in Corinth, as it starts to grow, God is using different people to do different things. We've got different giftings. And as the church starts to grow, people start to get incredibly jealous about other people's gifts. So much so that they start to measure up against one another. They start to base their own value upon what they feel is a good gift versus a bad gift. And this is what Paul says. Listen to what he says here. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 7, Paul is speaking to this idea of envying somebody else's gift, and he says this, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And in this amazing moment, Paul is saying, listen to me. None of us are going to have the same gifts. We're not all going to look the same. We're not all going to act the same or behave the same. Some of us might be good speakers. Some of us might be good at sports. Some of us might be unbelievable when it comes to business. We're not all going to have the same gifts but Paul goes on to tell us that it's the same God that distributes the same gifts, and he distributes those gifts for his glory. Church, I want to say to you today that it's so easy, it is just so easy to fall into the trap where we're so focused on how gifted other people seem to be that we actually miss the unique gifting that God has given us. Every single one of us have a gift. Every single one of us have a talent. Every single one of us have purpose. I actually will take it a step further and say that I believe that God reveals himself through every single one of us in a way that is completely unique to just us. There is something special about you. There is something unique about you. Don't waste another time envying somebody else's gift. And I think it's okay to honor a gift. I think it's okay to recognize the gifts in others. But man, you are also special and you are also unique and there is also something very special in your life. Love yourself enough not to allow a single minute to go by where you don't see the gifts that God has placed on the inside of you. Real love does not envy our neighbor's gifts. Moving on, real love does not envy your neighbor's wife. As I, uh, 
as I was thinking about this statement, um, it, came, it became very clear to me that we're living in a time where a lot of us don't even know our neighbors. So maybe as true and as biblical as the statement is, maybe the problem a lot of us are facing is not necessarily that we are envying our neighbor's partner. But as I was pondering this and I was, as I was thinking about this, it came very clear to me that as much as we might not be living our lives in such a way where we are envying a particular person, I do believe that we are living in a culture right now that has become so promiscuous and it has become so free in what it has to say about intimacy that a lot of us have gotten to the place where we envy that lifestyle. We envy that culture. I, um, I found myself in a position where as a young man growing up, I did not have a lot of relationships, girlfriends, that kind of thing. I was super into sports. I then became a Christian when I was 19 years old, and I then got married at a very young age. I did not have a season in my life where I really went and sowed my wild oats, so to speak. But as you live in the culture we are living in now, today, there is so much hype around sex and what it can do for you, and how powerful it is, and how awesome it is, and how amazing it is, and how wild it is. There is so much communication. There is so much language around it that I believe that if we're not careful, we can actually get to the place where we start to long after that life. I know that there's some of us in this place that um, we have done everything we can to follow after the Lord. We are living pure lives before Him. We are being faithful in our marriages. We are maybe single people trying our best to be pure, but we are living in a culture that is constantly yelling and screaming at us that there is a different way, there is a better way, there is a freedom and a fulfillment and a joy and a purpose and an identity that you will find in sex that you will not find anywhere else. And it's very tough sometimes to live and to stand within this culture. It is something that is constantly in our faces. Once again, this is something that Paul had to deal with in the church of Corinth. And um, there's this amazing portion of Scripture where Paul actually has to deal with this because sex is rife in the church. Um, They've become Christians. They are trying to build the church as best as they can. But it is a promiscuous culture. And there's all kinds of sexual things going on within this culture. So Paul has no choice but to address it. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 18 to 20. I'm going to tell you what Paul says here. Verse 18, um, it starts off and Paul says, Flee from sexual immorality. Let us pause there for one minute. Some of you are going, sexual immorality, what is that? You're telling me that there is sex that God is not happy with? Oh, I, hate, I, I hate to be the one to break this to this crowd this morning. Um, I know it's hard to hear and it's difficult to hear, but yes, we are actually, in fact, in a position where not all sex is good according to the Word of God. There is actually such a thing as immorality before God when it comes to sex. But listen to what Paul goes on to say here, and this is the thing that really stood out to me, and this is what is crucial for us to hear. Paul says, flee from sexual immorality, no matter how great it looks or no matter how much it promises, all other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Pastor Jacob said that so well this morning. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And Paul is telling us something unbelievable here, something that goes so stark against the culture that we're in. We're in a culture that is saying the following, hey, all life. All prosperity, all identity, all goodness, all fun, all freedom is found in living out every single sexual desire that you might ever have. This is where you need to live. This is where you need to stay. This is what you need to do. Paul comes along and he says, well, stop the bus. Actually flee from sexual immorality because sexual sin, sin that is outside of what God deems as holy, will actually destroy you. 
It's not just that God is sitting up in heaven going, man, I'm a grouchy old man, and I don't want anybody down there to have any fun. And that's how it feels sometimes when we are Christians. Sometimes it feels like as we read through God's commandments, it feels like God was just having a bad day. He woke up one Saturday, he felt a little grouchy, got out of bed, st stepped on a heavenly Lego piece, uh, and went, that's it, I've had enough. Cutting your pleasure down there. It's done down there for you guys. No more, no more soup for you, right? It feels that way. And it's not just, it does not just feel that way when it comes to God's commandments around sex, but it feels that way around God's commandments around a lot of different things. Sometimes when we don't understand the motive and we don't understand where it's coming from, it can start to feel like God is solely trying to take away from us. He's not trying to add into us. And when you look at where we're at in the culture, we're being told every day over and over again that all life is found over there. God is saying this to us today, hey, I know you, I created you, I put you together, I am the owner, I am the owner's manual, I am the creator, I know exactly what makes you tick, I know exactly what brings life to you, and I'm not trying to just be difficult, because I love you, says the Lord, I am going to instruct you in ways that don't always make sense to you. I remember one time, I, I think it was Vanessa, by the time you get your third kid, you can't quite remember who the kids were anymore. Uh, but it was one of the kids. And I believe it was Vanessa. I think she was about two years old. And we were somewhere. And she found an electric outlet. And she decided that she was going to put her finger into this outlet. That became her thing. 50 million Barbie houses over there. Dangerous thing you're not allowed to touch over there. Of course my child will go to the thing she's not allowed to go to. So I went and sat next to her. I told her no. I told her no again. I told her no again. I moved her to the other side of the room. She just giggled. He, he, he. Went back to the thing, tried to put her, the finger in the... So finally, I was like, okay, this is what we're going to do. I will not be broken by a two-year-old. I'm a man with a beard, for crying out loud. So every time she stuck a little hand out at the outlet, I went, no. And I gave a little spank on the hand, right? And she would take her little hand away, and she's like, ooh, that wasn't, that wasn't great. That wasn't awesome but I'm stronger than you with willpower, so I will break you. So she put out her little hand again. This continued for about two minutes. Eventually, the hand was kind of shaking like this. It was like a shaky red hand that she was sort of sticking out to kind of put it back in the outlet. And I just looked at her. I'm like, I can do this all day. Don't do it. Don't do it. She looked at me, and she pulled her hand back, and I was like, I won this one. And then she grabbed the other hand the one that wasn't injured, and she tried to put that into the outlet. Point of this message today is just pray for me, please. Um, <laughs> but we said this last week, and I feel like it's important we understand this. Remember last week we said that God is love. It's not just that He has love, or He feels love, or He thinks about love from time to time, but God is selfless love. So in the same way, there are moments where I will put down boundary with my kids, not because I'm trying to be spiteful, not because I had a bad day, but because I love them with all of my heart. And I'm going, I don't want you to be hurt. I don't want you to electrocute yourself. I'm telling you not to touch that outlet because I love you. And as God speaks to us and as He commands us and as He directs us, it's not because He is spiteful or being difficult. It's because he loves us and he doesn't want to see us destroy ourselves. Love does not envy our neighbor's gifts. Love does not envy our neighbor's wife. And then last one here today, real love does not envy your neighbor's life. Real love does not envy your neighbor's life. I, I love telling stories about when I was a kid, so I'll, I'll tell you another one. But there was this kid that came to our school that was just the kid, right? He was the coolest guy ever, just super good looking. He had an older brother, super good looking. Their parents were super good looking. Um, they were like the Cullens from Twilight. Uh, they had uh, tons of money. They would roll up at school in BMWs and Mercedes Benzes. They lived in the best neighborhood. They would go on the most incredible vacations. Um, he was also very gifted at sports. And I remember always just going, man, this kid's life 
is like the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. Like my life is awful, his life is amazing. If I could have this guy's life, all my problems would go away and everything would be better, right? This is sort of how I felt at the time. I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I think it's so true and that's why I mention it again. I don't know that we've ever been in a position where we are more tempted to look at other people's lives and what they have and what they don't have as much as we are right now in this culture today. Um, I remember a while back, we went on a family vacation and man, we, I just felt like we were crushing it. You know what I mean? It was that one family vacation where it was actually going well. I was like, man, this is a good family vacation. We haven't yelled at each other yet. Nobody's punched anybody yet. This is actually going fantastic. And then for some reason, I made the mistake of opening up Facebook. I don't know why I did it. And I saw what one of our friends was doing for vacation. And immediately I was like, hang on. That's what people do for vacation? So we're sitting here rubbing two sticks together. They're landing on Mars. Is that, is that what you're telling me? And immediately, I, I didn't like our vacation anymore. Immediately. I was like, I don't like our vacation anymore. I liked it five minutes ago. Now I hate our vacation. Then I went on this spiral, kind of like a little midlife crisis, where I started questioning every decision I ever made in my life. I'm like, where did it all go wrong? Why am I not on that vacation? Why am I on this vacation? What went wrong? And before you know it, if you think about it, as you envy this other person's life, you're actually now starting to question God's sovereignty in your life, is actually what starts to happen. What you're really starting to do is, is you're starting to go, if you really loved me, if you really had a plan for me, if you really knew who I was, you would have done things differently that I would not be in the situation that I'm in now. And quickly we get to that space where that envy of another person's life starts to rot the bones on the inside. Anyway, back to my story about my friend. I finally got an invitation to his house. It was a sleepover. I was so excited. And it was all true. It was all true. The car was amazing. The neighborhood was amazing. Their couches were amazing. I've never sat on a couch like that couch. It was unbelievable. The food was unbelievable. Everything was unbelievable. His life was so much better than mine. Everything was great. And then his mom and his dad got into the most vicious fight I've ever experienced in my life. They ran into the room, slammed the door. I could hear the screaming and the fighting and the shouting. I just sat there kind of like, I don't know what's going on. Then my friend's older brother told him that he was a loser and started beating him up on the floor in front of me on the nicest rug I've ever seen, just so, so did you know. <laughs> kind of punching him, but like on such a, I was like, don't get blood on the rug. It just looks like a really nice rug that you've got going there. The evening ended with the dad leaving upset and the mom in her bedroom. The brother left with his friends and me and my friend ended up in his room with him crying, telling me that he hates his life and he doesn't know how he's gonna carry on. It's at that moment where I realized his life wasn't so great and my life wasn't so bad. It was at that moment where I realized that what I had envied, what I had seen, what I had longed for was simply an outside mirage of what was actually going on. And what I need you to know today is, is that this, yes, your life isn't perfect. You've got problems in your life. You've got issues in your life. But can I tell you what else though? You've got some beautiful things in your life right now. You've got some great stuff in your life right now. You've got some things in your life right now that others would be envious of. I, uh, I love this portion of Scripture and it's in Hebrews, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to land on this, but Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 2, it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfect of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Unbelievable truth that I need you to grasp today. The Bible tells us, God tells us today that he has marked out this perfect race for all of us. You have a race that he's called you to run. You've got a purpose that he's called you to walk in. You've got gifts and you've got talents that he's given specifically to you. 
There is something about you that is unique and special. And I love how the Bible tells us that how do we do this? How do we walk in this calling? How do we finish this race? Well, let's take our eyes off of everything else. Take your eyes off of what that one has. Take your eyes off of what you don't have and what you should have. Take your eyes off of this. Take your eyes off of that. And as we place our eyes on Christ, as we place our gaze upon Him, He is the one that empowers us. He is the one that equips us. He is the one that brings peace in the heart. That peace that surpasses all human understanding. He is the one that brings that. He is the one that places that in us. I'm going to ask you to stand with me today. Abundant life is not found in the lust of the flesh, but rather it is found in the love of Christ. So this morning, just as we bow our heads and close our eyes in this place, Father, I just want to thank you for who you are, Lord Jesus. I want to thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you've longed for us, that you've wanted to be with us so badly, Lord, that you gave up everything that you have. You became bankrupt so that we might experience abundant life. I thank you, Lord, for your sovereignty. I thank you, Lord, for your commands in our lives. I thank you for your patience, your kindness. I thank you, Father, that we need not long for anything else, but it is in you, it is in your life, in your presence, in your grace, that we find everything that we need. So, Lord, I thank you that you are the one that satisfies. You are the one that satisfies completely. Father, I want to pray for all those in this space today that are feeling discontent with life. They're feeling like something is lacking. They're feeling like they're up against it. They're feeling like things have been unfair. They're feeling like they're not quite who they need to be or where they need to be. Father, I thank you that as we forget about all the noise, all the nonsense, and we place our gaze upon you, we rest in you, we put our trust in you. I thank you, Father, that as we do that, you will bring peace to the heart and that the life of the body will flow out of that peace today. We thank you for who you are, Lord.